Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation. Why open source works for DevOps monitoring, brought to you by Influx Data. I'd like to introduce you to our presenters, Chris Trulio. Chris is responsible for product marketing at Influx Data, and prior to Influx Data, she defined and designed a SaaS monitoring solution at Centroid, and prior to that, she was a VP of product management at IPASS and the LOB for several cloud services that required her to track the business and operational metrics and analytics to help identify and resolve issues. And our next presenter is Jacob Lisi. As a software engineer on Grafana Labs hosted platform team, Jacob works on a variety of projects with a special interest in ensuring the proper tooling is in place for monitoring various Kubernetes clusters. Recently, he has developed a Grafana Kubernetes plugin that plays well with PromQL. He loves working at Grafana Labs because it gives him the chance to contribute to the open source community and collaborate with passionate worldwide group of developers to advance the state of the field. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. And let's get started. So today what we're going to be reviewing is we're going to be talking about um, what InfluxDB and, and Grafana are, what are these two um, spectacular open source projects are all about, uh, why you should use them together. And we'll just go over a, a basic setup and talk about some common configurations um, that you should be aware of or that might help make your solution a lot more performant. And um, we'll go, uh, Jacob will also, you know, do a demo where we can go over some of the features and um, get you really excited to download both projects and start using them. All right. So uh, basically what we're talking about are two open source projects. And um, InfluxDB is a project that is... Um, is managed by Influx Data, and essentially it is a database that um, you can use to store your time series data. So any data that has a timestamp uh, and a value, and you use this kind of data to be able to measure the change over time of anything from your servers to your machines in a factory, uh, to your solar panels, to your servers, et cetera. All that data is timestamp data, and that is um, exactly what you would use in a purpose-built time series database. And once you have that data, then you want to be able to actually take a look at that data uh, so that you can determine what changes you might have to uh, enact into your solution. And that's when you would use Grafana, which is a really great dashboarding tool that easily connects to the InfluxDB data source so that you can build all kinds of really cool graphs. And also you can set some thresholds and um, send out alerts based on that data that you're collecting. And both are open source, and so you can just either go to the um, the appropriate GitHub pages or to the download pages on both of the sites on InfluxData.com or on GrafanaLabs.com to be able to download um, both of these projects. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what time series is, and um, and the reason that we want to do that is that we want to also help you understand why you want to build, um, you want to use specific projects like a time series database for this kind of, uh, from this data. And the most basic uh, definition of time series data is that it is a timestamp with a value. And the value, as I mentioned already, is going to be the value that you want to be able to track to understand if your machine in your factory is performant, if your CPU is consuming too many resources, if you are running out of disk space, these are all things that you want to be able to track so that you can understand what action to take next with those different devices so you can be a lot more efficient or you can avoid any kind of disastrous situations. And the way that you track them is that you grab that value uh, at a particular point in time and then you continue to grab that value at the next successes point in times. So it could be in, in, in minute intervals or second intervals, etc. And basically this is time series data. Um, so if you were to plot this data on a graph, you will always have one access be time. And that's the most basic definition of time series data. So this kind of data is data that we've been collecting for years and years and years. Uh, this is nothing new. Um, and, you know, I think um, 
uh, a lot of times we will just collect this data and when we're first looking at it, we might just throw it into a spreadsheet just to kind of understand what's going on. And we quickly outgrow that and then we'll throw it into a relational database, which is just fine. Uh, I've done it, we've all done it. Most people have started off with a database like MySQL to throw in uh, time series data just so they can start to take a look at that data and then ascertain you know, what's happening in, with their solutions. But there are some characteristics about time series data that um, we need to consider um, when we are using a um, traditional database. And the first one is that when we're looking at time series data, we're not looking at just collecting one metric. We're usually looking at collecting a lot of different metrics of, of our systems. Uh, in addition to that, we are also looking at various time intervals that we might be collecting this metric. So maybe majority of our metrics can be collected at the second interval, but there might be some that we need to collect at a millisecond interval. In addition to that, we're collecting metrics about a number of our different systems within the overall solution. And so all of a sudden, just if you think about the data that's getting collected within a 24 hour period, with all that in mind, you can just imagine that this is gonna be a lot of data that's coming in really quickly. In addition to that, the data is coming in really quickly because we actually want to be able to do something about the situation at hand. So as it's coming in, we also want to be able to query that data to be able to look at it, set some thresholds and alert us so that um, if there is something that needs our attention, we can dig into it even further and, um, and make sure that we can address whatever the situation is. So that means that as we're quickly throwing in data into the data store, we also need to very quickly be able to query that. And nobody's going to have patience for having slow queries on all that data that's coming in. So time series databases are optimized for these two particular things. And in addition to that, the amount of data that's getting thrown into this data is going to be huge. So we also, time series databases are also optimized to make sure that um, compression of that data and actually furthermore, uh, compaction of that data once all the points have come in uh, is also happening. And then the funny thing that um, about time series data is that you know, the sensitivity to um, that precise data is super important in the near real time, but over time, the data, the precision of that data might not be as important. So all that data that I'm collecting in a month's time, in six months time in a year, I probably don't need that, you know, millisecond or second level precision. I could probably actually get away with it, just understanding it at the, at the minute level, or even in some cases uh, in, in a, a 24 hour time span. And so what time series databases already have built in is that you can also uh, drop that data automatically by setting uh, certain retention policies, downsampling the data, et cetera. And the reason that time series databases do these things is because these are things that are just characteristics, certain things about time series data that are just that are just there. And so we want to make sure that that we're optimized for those characteristics. So having said that, you can build the same kind of functionality in a traditional relational database. And many people have, um, but what they've come to learn is over time, it's just kind of a pain to be able to maintain all those capabilities in a traditional database. You start to realize that I'm wasting my time on that when I really need to be dedicating my engineering efforts on features that are gonna make my solution unique. And so oftentimes people will start with MySQL and then they might graduate to something like a Cassandra and start to realize that, wow, this is actually taking up way too much storage, or this is a lot of work for me to be able to optimize for, for the characteristics of time series data. Um, so then the next logical step for a lot of people is that they might look towards other kinds of solutions, other kinds of databases. And because of the volume of the data that we were talking about, um, oftentimes people say, hey, let's just go and use a search database because that's really meant to be able to handle huge volumes uh, of data and um, I could do searches really quickly on it, which is great. But once again, there are the other characteristics that um, need to be taken into consideration. And so those have to be built as well. And so oftentimes people start to realize, well, maybe this isn't the solution as well. And then finally, the other type of solutions that we typically see people trying out is because oftentimes the data format comes into JSON, they're like, well, why not just use a document database to store that information? And similarly to the other, uh, other um, databases that are out there, uh, users tend to realize that there's a lot of extra work that they have to do to make sure that these databases are optimized for time series. And so really, 
what time series databases are trying to help you achieve is those, those capabilities that I've mentioned are already built in, so you don't have to worry about building those features. It's just a set of configurations that you have to apply to make sure it adheres to what you need it to do. And then off you go, it'll start collecting that data, storing it appropriately, allowing you to do really fast queries across that data, and allow you to then spend most of your efforts on building features that are gonna make your solution unique uh, instead of uh, just building out basically a time series data database. And there are a number of solutions that are out there that are actually using, that have actually made the switch from um, a, a product like MySQL to a product like InfluxDB, or actually there's a lot of other time series databases that they can make the switch to. And I just have a couple of solutions here where, or where they have not only chosen InfluxDB as their data store for time series data, but they've also chosen to do the visualization in Grafana. So the first um, example that I have here is from a company called New Voice Media. And basically, they are a SaaS call center. And um, with their solution, they have to make sure that they're really keeping their systems running performantly because the last thing they want is to have their solution be so slow that people are going to put out an angry tweet that's talking about how uh, disastrous the um, phone call that, that their user might have had with, um, with a support personnel. Um, and I feel kind of bad for them because we just seem to have no patience at all as humans when it comes to phone calls. So whenever any kind of a drop call happens or any kind of performance issue happens with that kind of a service, we just inherently just have no patience. And so it's really quick for people and quick and easy for people to make some pretty large complaints. So they really needed to make sure that they could stay ahead of that and try to address issues before users could actually um, even experience any kind of a problem, let alone complain about it. Um, so they have a number of dashboards that they've put in place that really help them to understand across the board, you know, how things are performing, whether it's infrastructure or the application itself. They're actually been instrumenting a number of things in their solution to be able to make sure that they could set, stay ahead of the issues. The um, second example that we have is a company, another SaaS company called uh, Coupa Software, and they basically have a spend management platform. And similarly, you know, whenever you use any kind of a SaaS solution, um, the tolerance for slowness uh, is just not, we just can't handle it anymore as users. We've just gotten so used to, to having everything at um, the touch of our fingertips. And um, they actually um, decided to um, reevaluate their entire monitoring solution that they had. And they had a number of paid for services that they were okay with. But what they were struggling with is that they found that it wasn't quite as extensible as they needed it to be. And they also found that a lot of the data that they were collecting was actually locked into the uh, SaaS solution. And it didn't allow them to put the data into other data stores so they could use it for um, historical reporting purposes. They also wanted to do some um, pretty in intense forecasting with that data. And uh, they just weren't able to do it because everything was just locked in, which is unfortunately, the case a lot of times for closed off software or for SaaS versions. And so with open source projects, you know, it's really up to you. And, um, and it was evident in this use case where they were able to not only quickly, you know, build a new monitoring solution with InfluxDB and Grafana, but they were also able to throw the data into their own machine learning framework to be able to really take advantage of that data that they are collecting to help to determine what steps they should take uh, moving forward to make sure that they can ensure performance of their solution overall. And then finally, um, another um, SaaS solution from a company called Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. You may have heard that name before, maybe you've seen that logo before. Uh, these guys are, they've been in business for over 100 years and they've been producing or uh, publishing educational books. And so most people just think of them as a book publisher but they actually have a pretty impressive um, online education uh, service. And um, similar to the other SaaS vendors, they really needed to make sure that they could not only understand the performance of their solutions, but they wanted to make sure across the board of their entire development process that they can understand and look for areas for um, of um, optimization, making sure that things were really working efficiently, but also wanted to make sure that they gave their developers the flexibility and allowing them to have the ability to work autonomously and collect whatever 
metrics that they needed within their areas uh, to make sure that they could um, ensure their um, code was uh, working really well. So three different examples of um, using these open source solutions uh, with great success. So let's dig in a little bit more about these uh, two projects. So um, on the left, we have Influx Data, which is actually four open source projects. Uh, and um, at the heart of it is InfluxDB, which I've already described, which is a time series database. It is purpose built, meaning that it was written just for the purpose of collecting, collecting and storing time series data. It's written in Go, so it's a really great excuse to uh, play around with it. And you can write data directly into InfluxDB via HTTP or a set of client libraries that we have. Or alternatively, you can use another very popular open source project, which is called Telegraph. And Telegraph is just essentially a, a bunch of collector agents that the community has built. So inf the um, staff at Influx Data only built a couple of the Telegraph agents, and majority of them were actually written and contributed by the community members. And there are currently over 200 of these agents, you know, ranging from things like maybe uh, metrics from databases. Um, you can there's an HTTP listener. There's a whole bunch of um, really great collector agents that are out there that uh, you can take a look at. The other thing that's really great and probably one of the reasons why Telegraph is so popular is that you could write your own agent. And um, if you choose to um, share it back in the community, you can or you, or you don't have to. But if you happen to have a data format that um, you would like to be able to then convert into um, a format that InfluxDB can ingest, you can easily create a, um, a Telegraph uh, plugin. And it really doesn't take that much time at all. There's some really great uh, videos and uh, documentation that can help you do that. The other two uh, projects that we have is there's also a, an administrator UI for InfluxDB. So if you want to take a look at what data you're actually collecting, you could do that very easily. Of course, you could just use the command line to do that as well. And then there's a, a data uh, processing engine called Capacitor. So if you want to be able to mani manipulate that data further, you can um, with Capacitor. On the right-hand side, we have Grafana. And Grafana is a very popular um, visualization tool. And the thing that I appreciate about Grafana is that it supports multiple data sources, uh, which I think is really important, especially in an open source project. You don't want to be just closed down to one particular data source. You have so many data sources that you have to contend with in your infrastructure that you want to be able to have a single dashboard that can be able to pull in data from a bunch of different things build really great dashboards that can be um, very useful to all levels of personnel within your facilities and your organizations, from the management tier down to uh, people in operations or even the operators of any of the equipment in any of the factories that you have. And in fact, um, one particular use case that I want to share with everybody is that in a um, uh, energy producing plant, um, they they never considered giving the operators of the equipment a Grafana dashboard, but they just happened to do so. And what happened was the operators uh, became really intrigued with these dashboards and started really digging into the data and wasn't expected by the uh, supervisors or the, the management team. And um, as the um, people were digging into that data, they actually found some data that didn't look right that um, then um, allowed them to um, look into um, some of the equipment and actually found that there was a pretty significant leak that somehow their sensors had missed. And by addressing that early, they were able to actually save the company half a million dollars. And you know, when you think about it, oh, it's just a dashboard, it's not. It's actually more than that. It's an ability to provide, it's, it's, um, it's an option to provide to your employees for them to start to look into the data to do some further analysis. And I think it's especially important because, you know, oftentimes they're the ones that are really interacting uh, with that machinery. And, um, and they're the ones that can probably, you know, spot these things um, faster than, than anyone. So I think I probably described why you want to use them together, uh, but we'll just go over it one more time. Now the whenever you're trying to collect any kind of uh, data to understand change over time of your uh, infrastructure, of your servers, of you know any of the solutions that you're creating, you definitely need to collect time series data. 
And InfluxDB and Grafana are just perfect uh, combination to be able to collect that data, store it, and actually um, start to do that query of that data so that you can understand what's happening in your environment. Both are open source, and um, they're both really simple to get started. Um, in fact, I just wrote a tiny little blog about that, getting started with it, and literally it just takes a couple of minutes to be able to download both projects. Get um, what I what I would recommend is that you can actually start to collect metrics about your laptop. And you can quickly start to build some really nice dashboards in Grafana that's telling you how, how well you're doing with your own laptop. Uh, and once you do that, you start to realize how powerful the combination is. And you can start to consider other data sources and how you might use this in your organization. So just looking at the architecture, as I mentioned, we have Telegraph, which is a set of collector agents, and you can put them on uh, any of the hosts that you have to collect various kinds of uh, metrics. You can use, we have an SNMP plugin for any of the um, hosts that you have that are dealing with networking uh, or ping, uh, the HTTP listener. There's a bunch of different um, agents that you can use to grab the uh, metrics. And that will very easily throw that um, information into InfluxDB. And once it's in um, InfluxDB, you can then easily uh, query that data in Grafana and um, get these really great uh, dashboards and off you go. But in, in addition to just throwing the data into InfluxDB from the collector agents, you can actually add more metadata to, that data, to the data that's collecting, which is really going to help you to um, build even better dashboards. So if you wanted to you know, add information about maybe the location of those hosts, or you know, maybe it's you wanna, when you, you wanna list out maybe a specific data center, specific rack, uh, or even you know, specific place in the country, you can also add that. Um, sometimes some of our users, when they're collecting sensor data, they might wanna also add information about the, uh, maybe there's a product ID they want it to be associated with. Um, or any other attributes uh, about the uh, machine, you can also add that into um, the metadata. And that really makes that data much more rich and much more interesting to be able to then do some analysis on it. Um, in addition to just collecting the data from your equipment, you can also add other data from other data sources. So maybe weather is gonna be important, maybe, um, uh, sometimes like personnel schedule is important. So there's a bunch of other data sources that you you can add into InfluxDB, marry that together, and then when you present that uh, in your visualization, you can start to see patterns uh, that were that went um, unnoticed previously. Um, and then the other thing that you can do with uh, Grafana, as I have kind of on the side, is that you could set thresholds. So if you want to um, alert, either maybe you want to send alerts to an incident management system like a PagerDuty or a VicDrops, you can do that. Or you can also trigger workflows. And workflows could be to people or they can also um, be in some automated fashion. But to help to make sure that we can um, the, the two projects can help you to be um, a lot more seamless in your interactions with your solutions, as well as in the um, in in making sure that things are going to get addressed as quickly as possible. So you can download uh, the open source bits from GitHub, or you can go to the URL that we have posted here. Um, both of them, like I mentioned, are open source. Uh, both of them are being used by really large organizations. I think one thing that I want to make sure that is pretty clear is that sometimes people think open source means that it's going to, it's it's not optimal for their environment, or it's going to require a whole bunch of configuration, or it's going to take all day to install, and it's absolutely not the case for both of these projects. And um, it's actually being used, the open source projects are being used at some really large organizations around the world. And um, you can easily just uh, Google um, InfluxDB or Fauna and you'll see a bunch of blogs uh, from a bunch of really impressive companies. Um, and they describe how they're using these open source projects quite successfully. Um, so I'm just gonna really quickly go through uh, just some of these, um, these steps. Um, you know, once you go and download um, uh, both of the projects, you just install them, follow the instructions for uh, the device that you're going to be installing them on, 
And then as far as creating a, a database into InfluxDB, it's really, really simple. Um, you just have to go in. You can even see the instructions here. Just create the database with its name. And then you can see all the databases that have been created. There's one database called underscore internal that's uh, that's automatically created that helps to actually uh, collect metrics about the um, about the databases that you're collecting or you that you're creating. And then you can just start using uh, the database and inserting any of the data that you want to. So you can insert it via um, Telegraph, as I mentioned, very easily. Or you can also insert it using um, what we call line protocol, which is basically kind of like our uh, format. So you can see uh, very easily that in order to insert data, I have to uh, write a measurement name, what we call a measurement name. In this particular case, it's CPU. And then I separate uh, the rest of the data with a comma. Um, and the first uh, data point that I can add is going to be what we call a tag. And um, in this particular case, we're adding the tag of host. And uh, in this data point, it's actually going to be server one. Um, I can actually add a second tag. Remember, I said that you can add lots of metadata to the, um, to the value that you want to collect. And so I have a location of US West. And then you'll notice that we have a space and the word value equals 10. And what that space is uh, signifying is that that's separating the tags from the values or the fields. And so in this particular case, I'm collecting a value of 10, and I'm actually calling it value in this case. And then if there's no timestamp added, uh, InfluxDB will automatically insert a timestamp. And um, but my recommendation is that as you're adding the, um, this uh, data into the database, that you actually use the, the timestamp of when the data was actually collected. So you'll probably, you know, if you use Telegraph or if you're collecting this from any of your other solutions, my recommendation is that make sure at the time that that um, data is collected, use that timestamp and then throw that into InfluxDB. Because most, most times that's what we're actually more um, interested in than um, the time that it's actually inserted into InfluxDB because it could be, um, it could, there could be some kind of a delay. And then the cool thing is you'll notice that um, querying this data looks really familiar. Uh, so it's very simple to be able to, uh, to you know, use the query language that's in here. And, um, and then you can get your, your values. So with that, um, let's go in a deeper dive with a demo from Jacob. So Jacob, I'm going to switch and make you presenter. Perfect. All right, I think um, I have the wheel now. So I'm, I have on my local laptop a Docker Compose running with InfluxDB, Grafana, and Telegraph. So I've been sending Telegraph metrics to Influx for the past about half an hour or so. And um, I have a Grafana that will be able to query that InfluxDB. So we can get started straight onto that. So here's my Grafana instance, everyone can see that. Um, this is the login page you'll see when you log into Grafana. Um, by default, all Grafanas start at 43,000 unless you change it in the config. Um, so there's a default password and it will prompt you to change on a new instance. Um, I'm gonna skip that for now because I'm gonna destroy this instance as soon as we're done presenting. So here's what happens when you first log into Grafana, this is what you're presented with. You're presented with your home dashboard. And uh, at the top is a set of steps to basically get started with your Grafana instance. So the first thing we need to do is add a data source. Um, the data source we're gonna add is gonna be our InfluxDB instance that is also spinning in the back end. Um, so on the, this is the add data source panel for Grafana. Um, you can see that we support a variety of data sources. This is just the ones that come by default. Uh, we also have a community of people building custom data sources because you can basically make your own. It, it's a plugin architecture. Every data source is a plugin. So if you wanted to make a custom data source for something in-house that is super specific to your company, you have the option to do that. So let's log into our, our InfluxDB data source that we have created. And down here is the uh, default bucket. So basically, this is just telling Grafana like which bucket to query in InfluxDB by default, although you can change which bucket you query later. So this is the bucket that's created by Telegraph, which is currently sending data to Influx. 
and it looks like it's successfully added. Um, we can actually come here and look, and you can see each of these is a request from Telegraph to Influx through the HTTP API for InfluxDB to basically write data. So we've been writing data for quite a while now, it looks like. So now I'm going to click back and go back to our main page, our home dashboard. And the next step would be to add a new dashboard. So the first thing you're presented with when you create a new dashboard is the new panel like selection menu. Um, we have an option of a variety of different types of panels. I'll probably go through a few of them. The first and probably the most common panel used is the graph panel. So that is what you would imagine it is. It's a, a panel that shows graph over a graph over time. So right now our panel has no data, but you get a sense of what it is displaying. At the bottom, there's a time range. At on the left on the y-axis on the left side, you can see some default values. So we can click our panel and go into the edit page. Um, there's actually short code, so if you wanted to, you could just type, you could become a wizard and learn all of the hotkeys to do this really quickly. I'm just gonna click my way through it. So right here is the default query for querying um, InfluxDB 2.0 from Grafana. Um, it's in the updated, it's in the new query language Flux for InfluxDB. Um, so if this looks unfamiliar to you, this is the, um, different than the, the original Influx query language that was in their previous version or their 1.0 version, everything up until that. Um, you can read more about this on Influx's site. It's a really powerful, really cool query language that you can use to query time series data. And it's actually specifically designed to make querying time series data easy and it's and powerful. So this query right here is not one I plan on running because what this will do is it'll go through that telegraph bucket. And um, basically you can see in the top right corner here in Grafana, there's this last six hours. So this range variable right here is related to this time picker in the top right. So this will basically query every data point over the last six hours, although it'll be limited to a thousand. So instead of running that query, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use some short codes here and do my own query. And I'm gonna do a query for usage idle. So for anyone who doesn't know what that is, CPUs, when they're not working, there's an increment counter that increases every time there's a second where a CPU core is idle or not performing any work. So I'm gonna run this query right here. And as you can see, we have some data. Let me change the time picker to so it's a little bit easier to see. So when you click the time picker, you're basically selected with some quick ranges, some like more commonly used things like the last two days, last half hour, last hour. But you also can do a custom range to get exactly what you want and you can, either put in like now minus a certain amount of time or you can actually put in like an actual um, RTF timestamp. So this is our idle usage over the past hour. Over the past hour. So this is kind of the gist of what you're gonna get when you start using time series data in, in Grafana. Um, you, you can start quickly putting together graphs with various different series and display them however you wish. Um, you can edit the panel you can change how the axes are displayed. You can change the units of the axes. So in this case, it'll be seconds. So I'm gonna put that here, because technically that's what this is measuring. Um, you can change how you do it in terms of uh, like the scale. The, you can do, use a log scale. You can use a log scale of various uh, magnitudes. Um, so there's, there's really a lot of flexibility in terms of how you structure your Grafana panels. You have the option to have to update how the legend is displayed. You can either have it on the right, you can have values displayed with the legend. So you can do, you definitely are given a lot of flexibility in terms of how you display your data. And that's one of the nice things about Grafana. It, it focuses much more on the user experience and on the uh, visualizations more so than like the data itself and like storing the data. Cool. So, The next thing I wanna show everyone is a different type of panel. I'm gonna to go to the single stat panel. Let me just update this legend because there's not enough series to really use the to the right part of the table. 
So this is different than the graph panel in the sense that it, this is only going to display one number. So you would use this for data that is you want to aggregate to some kind of sum or like some kind of average. So for example, let's do the same thing we just did. Do a CPU and then instead of using usage I'm going to use system. I want it to get to load. It's not in the CPU. So here we go. So this is a great stat that could be used for the single stat panel, the number of CPUs. So the, at the end of the day, like there's only one telegraph value. I mean, I only have one number of CPUs. There's not, there's only going to be one series. And uh, as you can see, my local host has two CPUs, although technically it has more. I just limited the uh, access telegraph has to only two, which is because I don't want it slowing down the rest of the stuff I'm doing. Um, so as you can see here now, we have two panels and I can show you some of the cool features within Grafana in terms of like editing and manipulating dashboards. So you can, we have a grid system. It allows you to place that panels wherever you want and uh, organize them however you wish. And it kind of seamlessly moves around as you drag and drop. You can resize panels really quickly. So, in terms of like the flexibility of how you design your dashboard, you're, you're not really limited in any way, shape or form. We used to have a system that was kind of more structured, but as of Grafana 5.0, um, you're, you're able to do a lot more in terms of how you design and structure your dashboards. Cool. So there's a few more cool features I want to show you and you can get a sense of the more of the more powerful features within Grafana and the things you can really do. So the first thing I want to show everyone is how to use template tags. So I'm going to go to this top right section here and go to variables. So what this section does is it lets you basically create variables within Grafana that you can later use in your queries. So if you're wondering what I mean by that, I'm going to show you right here. So let me choose um, a variable. I'm going to name this field. Or actually, I'm going to name it measurement. And the data source I'm going to query is that the influx data source that we had earlier. And uh, the measurements query is a special query designed specifically for the influx DB data source um, for flux right here. So you give it this special query called measurements, and then you put the name of the database. There we go. I just forgot the S at the end of measurement. Um, so as you can see here, what this does is this query goes to InfluxDB and gets all of the measurements that are in the Telegraph database. And so we have CPU, disk, disk IO, kernel. Um, you might have seen them earlier when I was doing those queries and showing you the short codes. Like when I do Telegraph dot, like there was the option to do CPU, disk, disk IO. So we now we'll add that here. And when we go back and see, now in the top left hand corner, we have a drop down with all of our different measurements. And let me show you how you can use those in a query. Let me just resize everything I wanted to. Okay, so we have our influx query here. Let me do the same thing I was doing earlier, but it, and I'll just use the short code to get a quick query built out. But instead of having measurement equals CPU, I'm going to change that to measurement equals dollar sign measurement. So the dollar sign in Grafana is a special char is a special um, character when Grafana parses and sends the query to influx or to any data source, it looks for this character and then basically inserts or replaces that with whatever variable is set in the template tag field. So in this case, measurement is sent to CPU. So if we send this query, this measurement should end up being 
change to CPU. And let's see if that works. Yep, and as we can see here, we have a large set of all of our CPU measurements. So the next thing we I want to show you guys is there's another, I mean, if you're more familiar with Influx, there's not only measurements, but there's also a concept of fields. And um, fields are basically like a hierarchical symbol within each measurement that allows you to query different types of data. So CPU is the measurement, but as you can see here, usage guessed or get you, um, all of these other values to the right of CPU are the actual um, field. So I'm going to go through here and use this autocomplete to build a new query. Or actually, I can just use short code. That's usually a little faster. Cool, so now we have our field here and our measurement here. So I'm gonna put measurement back here. And I'm gonna actually create a new template variable called field here. So right now field technically doesn't exist. So if we run this query, we're gonna end up with a, an error. See, so I refresh the panel and now there's no data because there is no field template variable. So when it tries to filter, it, it's not gonna find anything because it's not looking for anything in particular. So let me go back up here and go to variables and now let's add the field variable. So this is again based on, this is a special query we use right here in our influx query language. Um, you can find it on this GitHub repo or on the Grafana site. So let me get, this will basically query a bucket or a data, data source and you give it a measurement and it'll give you all the fields for that measurement. I didn't put in dollar sign. There we go. So now here we have CPU and then all of the different fields within CPU, like usage guest, usage guest nice, idle. So if I switch to idle, now this panel looks the exact same as this panel. Um, and you can keep switching through and drop down and find whatever you want or whatever you're really looking for. And this is a pretty simple example, but having the ability to put metadata in template tags and then put it into queries is pretty powerful and allows you to make some really interesting dashboards. Um, so the next thing I want to show everyone is how to use the annotation feature. So I'm going to create I'm going to create another panel quick, um, and I'm not necessarily going to worry about how this panel looks. I just want to use it to get an idea of how some of our data looks. So this is going to be a table panel, which I don't think I've shown anyone yet. So this is a third panel in the list. So let's look in here, and we can find actually uh, instead of kernel, let's do disk IO. I'd like to do use that one a lot. Um, and let's do write time. So here we have the, the uh, table panel. It kind of looks kind of weird. You have a timestamp and then each field is a column name and they're pretty long so it doesn't necessarily look that great. Um, but we also have the option to change how we format the data. So we can format that as a table instead. And this is a lot nicer to look at. So instead of the column being the field name, um, the columns are time, measurement, field, tag. So like these are like InfluxDB specific column names. Um, and it gives you a lot better an idea of how your data looks. And uh, so let me show you how you can use functions within an Influx query to manipulate and change what you're doing with your data. So let's take this here and instead of just having the raw query with the right time, let's do the derivative of the right time. Let me see what that says. Cool.
Okay. Sorry, I just, you have to select a range before you can use that kind of function. It's more of an implementation detail, I'm sorry. So now is the timestamps, instead of showing the raw value of the write time, it shows the difference in the raw value of the write time from the previous timestamp. So as you can see here, we have, it, look, it looks like there, these were, between this timestamp and the previous timestamp, there was an increase of six, of nine. So there was nine seconds spent writing to disk in this, from this timestamp, from whatever the previous timestamp was. Um, if we were to graph this, it would be very spiky with a lot of zeros and then sudden spikes of disk IO. The, the other cool thing we can do with this that relates to what I was talking about earlier in terms of annotations is we can, we can filter this again and we'll get rid of the limit at the end. We don't really need that. So let's filter this and we'll only return disk IO that's greater than maybe let's say six. So these are all the instances of where more than six seconds were spent in disk IO from the previous timestamp. So you're asking like, why is that useful? Like this isn't, no one really wants to look through a table to figure out this kind of information. But we, what we can do now is we can take that query we just made and go to the annotations section of the Grafana dashboard settings, and we can add an annotation query. And we can call it high disk IO. And we'll query flux for this data. And I'm gonna paste that query in that we just created in that table. Save it again. So now this looks pretty different because now we have on top of every single graph that we made, we have this these red lines. So these red lines are what in Grafana we call annotations. Um, annotations are basically just like metadata on top of the graph that you can change how they're displayed to make them look unique. You can change what this text says. So right now this text is just the value of the of the of the uh, data that we're using to create the annotation. Um, but this is an example now of every single graph has times like an event marker on it of when disk IO was high. So you can use that to associate with things that are happening in your panel. So like, let's view this panel for a second. So you see right here when there's large drops in usage, I mean, when there's, when, when idle goes down, that means your system's doing a lot of work that seems to maybe correlate with some, with some periods of high disk IO. Um, that's something that definitely is, it, it gives you the sense of what might be going on with your system beyond what's necessarily on the graph. It allows you to kind of correlate data points with other data points. And that's one really cool thing that you can do with time series data and InfluxDB and Grafana. Um, so in terms of like what this allows you to do, it allows you to really understand what you're looking at in, within your application and across your environments. Um, and, and, and you might, get the sense that this might be difficult to create these dashboards. They're really simple to create. It's a lot of drag and drop. It's really intuitive. And uh, it's just figuring out like what your data is that you want to display and how to display it. But once you really figure out what you're looking for, Grafana and Influx make it really easy to kind of orient and display the data for your company and make it useful for people using your systems. Um, so if that pretty much covers some basic features within Grafana, how to use um, the data source backends, how to query various different ways to display your data, um, how to use annotations. If there's any questions or like you want to learn any more, have anything specific to ask, I'm in the question and answer section. I'd feel free to ask and I can jump back onto this demo and show you how to do it. But um, I think that gives a pretty good overview. So if we want to move back to the presentation. Yeah, why don't we do that? And then let's open it up for a, a Q and A. Let's see. Hello. Awesome. Awesome. We do have a few questions that have come in. The first question that we have is, what is your query language like? It has time constructs that make it better or easier than SQL. Um, I, I don't think it makes it, uh, it, well, it's, it makes it familiar, I think is the right answer. So it's not exactly SQL, but it's, um, and when you start to play around with it, you can, you can feel pretty familiar with it and can get started really quickly. Great. 
Actually, that does look like the only question that we have. So audience, if you do have any more questions, please ask them in the questions panel. Oh, we did get one more question come in. The question is, how is InfluxDB different than Elastic? Yeah, that's a, a pretty common question. So uh, the key difference is that um, what we're gathering is we're actually gathering a time series data that's going to um, help to articulate the, um, you know, how your systems are performing, whereas Elastic is really um, about grabbing all the logs from your various uh, systems, putting them into a single data source, and then from there deriving um, the metric data to try to understand how things are, are performing. Uh, the most popular use case is actually using them in conjunction. So using InfluxDB and Grafana to be able to understand uh, with the metrics gathered how things are going. And when there's something that looks a little bit different, whether good or bad, and you want to dig into the logs, then that is going to be a really quick indication for you to do so. Uh, and then you can you know, go right into the details. Um, instead of you know having all the details available and then try to understand the patterns, this is just uh, to help you become a lot more efficient in your processes. There, there's awesome. also an aspect to that where so a, a data store like Elastic isn't necessarily optimized for this use case, so it it can't necessarily if you're doing high level alerting and you're doing alerts across your systems, if you have any kind of scale, something like Elastic wouldn't be able to hear, handle the query load for a system that's used widely. Awesome. We do have a couple more questions that have come in. The next question is, does Grafana work with other databases for non-time series data? Yeah, but that's not necessarily the focus of Grafana, so the use cases would be somewhat limited. Um, you can you can use Grafana for other time series, I mean, for other databases. I mean, we use, we have SQL plugins, so you can use it with SQL. Um, and there's actually a few other, like you can even use it with just like an HTTP endpoint and you can make your own custom plugins to do whatever you want. However, um, like the main panels, like the graph panel, uh, the, it, like things like that are kind of structured around the idea of time series data. So uh, if you're going to use Grafana for non-time series uh, data points, you're going to be using it more as like display sugar, like contextual information that goes with your other data. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily use Grafana just for an SQL database. You would use it for a time series database. And then if you wanted to have some information displayed on your dashboard from an SQL database or a few other things, you can do that. Great. The next question that we have is, can you tell us any more about InfluxDB 2.0 and the Flux query language? What's the current status and where are they going? Oh, wow, we could spend all day on that. Um, uh, and and not, not just me, I think uh, Jacob can as well. So um, uh, it's still in development, but we have, um, we have a, um, an alpha that's available and uh, we recommend that everyone take a look at it. What uh, Jacob was actually showing you was, um, he was actually using um, the uh, Flux language and, um, you know, I think one of the key things that um, we struggled with with, uh, one dot, with the 1.0 product line is that there were so many things that uh, we couldn't do. We couldn't do math across measurements. Uh, it wasn't easy to be able to um, do some of the queries, um, you know, across different data sources. And so um, uh, Paul and the team had the foresight to come up with a, just a new approach to being able to query um, across the different data sources that um, as you saw that in Jacob's uh, demo is definitely a lot easier to do and it's gonna be a lot more powerful. Um, any other comments from you, Jacob? You've been using it in the last uh, few months. Flux is a really powerful language. Um, you can do a lot with it. it it's a very expressive language. Um, it allows you to do really cool things like that thing I showed in my demo about how to have disk IO displayed as an annotation on your graphs. Um, it, it's specifically designed, it seems like, it, and a lot of the thought behind it was based on the idea of creating a, a language for manipulating, analyzing, and transforming time series data. And it, it, it definitely hits the mark on that. I don't think any other database has a query language quite suited for this use case. Great. 
that does look like all the questions that we do have. Is there anything that either of you would like to add before we close things out? I, I think the number one thing is just try it for yourself, download it. Um, you could see that uh, in the demo that Jacob uh, shared with us that it's super easy to just collect the metrics from your, your laptop. It's easy to build out the dashboards and the various panels that go with it. And you start to see that um, anyone can really start to uh, interact with it. Uh, and hopefully that'll be an inspiration point for you to then you know, take these projects further. Great. And with that, I would like to thank you, Chris and Jacob, for a great presentation today. I would also like to thank today's sponsor, Influx Data, for providing the audience with a great webinar presentation. And lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.